Slimehouse TV at Horrorcon UK 2016, just here with the legendary Doug Badler. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are you finding Horrorcon so far? Uh, I, I'm finding it fine. No, it's, it's very, very good. Uh, was tremendously busy yesterday. It's been busy again this morning, so uh, it's all been good. I uh, had a fantastic crowd at my Q&A yesterday. So, all good. Well done, Sheffield. We love you. That's what we like to hear. Uh, just wanted to ask you a little bit about your career and acting in particular. Yourself and Clive Barker, you worked together for like 10 years before you ever actually got into the feature film stuff. What was it like when you finally got that break and actually making a feature film? I don't know. There's much to say, really. I mean, it, it was exciting that... Uh, um, that I was going to work with Clive on a, on a you know, proper grown-up movie, so to speak, because we'd, we'd done stuff before, messing around on 16 mil and Super 8, you know, and so now suddenly it's, you know, this this is real. Uh, so that was great. I mean, it, and it was Clive's, the, the first movie Clive had directed, it was my first movie. I, I'd been, after the dog company had broke up, I'd been working in... Uh, fringe and repertory theatre up and down the country so it you know it was it was exciting I didn't know what it was going to lead to no idea it was going to lead to any of this stuff but you know uh, it, yeah it was it, it was exciting you obviously continue to work with Clive for a long time him being a friend that you knew from school how do you find it working with people that you don't really know too well on big projects in comparison to working with someone that you've like grown up with? What's that like? It doesn't really make any difference, to be honest. I mean, you're a working actor, it's, it's your job, you approach the work. There's a satisfaction with working with people that you know well. I mean, so in Clive's case, when I read the, the screenplay for Hellraiser, and in particular in reading Pinhead, having been around Clive's imaginative world, for 20 years prior to to Hellraiser, um, in, in both in, in terms of, of previous uh, film stuff we've done and theatre work and his write, uh, other writings uh, and his artwork, there were elements of Pinhead that were immediately familiar. And also, I, I, I guess I can kind of sometimes shorthand what work lives going I can see what's exciting him about things and he has a habit of making always making references to other things so it might throw you as an actor to have a director suddenly making a reference to a T.S. Eliot poem or a Giotto painting or, uh, um, or a Goya print in the, in, the, in the middle of directing a scene but I, I would know exactly where his head was going if he was making those connections. But, in, but you know, by the same token, working with people that you've never worked before is also exciting and you, you know, you, you, you spark off e each other and so uh, each, each movie presents its own challenges and its own rewards. So that sounds really boring, but you know. No, it's not at all. We like this. <laughs> Just, could you tell me a little bit about what inspired you to be an actor? Like who you looked up to, the people that, that were your inspirations? I don't know really. I mean, I, the, the first time I knew this was something very exciting, um, I was sitting in the stalls of the Empire Theatre in Liverpool uh, at the age of about seven. Um, watching Norman Wisdom and Bruce Forsyth in pantomime playing cricket with bags of sweets. So one of them was on one side of the stage uh, tossing bags of candy to the other who had a cricket bat and was batting them out into the audience. And I remember watching this thinking, it looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> I could do that. Um, uh, and, and that's a memory that sticks very firmly in 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 my head. Um, I, d I, d I don't know that I would say I was I was particularly inspired by any one actor. Theatre really was was the reason uh, that I wanted to become an actor. And then movies came along, and I, when I became an actor, it wasn't with any specific ambition to work in the genre that's kind of happened by accident if I 
If I reference any one actor now, it's always Peter Cushing, who is my, my god and my hero among uh, uh, horror actors. And I, I was a fan of horror movies as a teenager before I knew I was going to be an actor. And I kind of came in on the ground floor or I cut my teeth watching the, the, the Hammer movies. Granada Television in the early 1970s uh, every Monday night, I think it was, they used to run a, a Hammer movie after news at 10. And that was that was my, my horror graduation class. And it was always for me, Peter Cushing. I've always said that the if you take the whole of the Frankenstein, the Hammer Frankenstein series, um, he very quickly becomes the focus, not the creature. Uh, and it's one of the great, the great cinematic essays in Evil, his character gets darker and more and more amoral, just simply amoral as the series goes on and uh, there's some really powerful performances in, in the later Frankenstein movies. Frankenstein created woman and Frankenstein and the creature from hell. Um, but he could switch that around from playing Baron Frankenstein to to that pure intensity that he brought to his Van Helsing. My favorite one. And he could just switch the two around. Of course, he before Hammer Films came along, he was winning awards. Um, uh, the, the BBC did a live broadcast of George Orwell's 1984 that Cushing starred in. He was my, sh my first Sherlock Holmes. He played Holmes for the BBC, and that was, that was my first real exposure to Holmes. So he's always been my favorite Holmes. Um, and uh, he, outside of the TV series, he's my favorite Doctor Who, from, from Doctor Who and, and uh, uh, I've lost the titles, the Dalek, but there's two of them he did for Hammer, in Invasion Earth, was it? And Doctor Who and the Daleks, yeah. So he's, he's, he's one of my top favorite, probably my second favorite doctor after Patrick Troughton, I think. Um, I just, so so if, if there's anyone ever in my head, if I approach a part thinking, um, you know, if, if this is worthy of Peter Cushing, then, uh, then I'll be okay. And if you aspire to him as a human being as well, you know, I'm, I've never, I've spoken to a lot of people who worked with him and knew him. I've never heard anybody ever say a bad word about him. In fact, people people get moved to tears still talking about him. You know, but wonderful, wonderful man and a brilliant actor. Talking a little bit about acting, what would your advice be for anyone that's wanting to get into acting now? And if they do ever get them knockbacks, how to handle that? A bit of Doug Bradley advice. Well, you will get the knockbacks. It's all about the knockbacks. It really is. Um, the, the, the most common piece of advice you'll hear from, from actors of, of my venerable age to aspiring actors is don't. I won't do that because I think that's like the junkie telling people to say no to drugs. <laughs> uh, what I do always say is uh, be careful of your motivation. If it has anything to do with money or fame, forget it. Uh, because the money is very, very unlikely to come along. If fame does come along, it may be fleeting, um, and it may be a double-edged sword. And if you, if, you, if you want to be famous that much, read the news or uh, you know, be a weather presenter, because that'll get you just as famous, and you'll have job security. Because um, I've, I've always said the, the, the thing with acting is, you know, we, we, we like to call ourselves artists. We flatter ourselves greatly, I think, in that regard. But, you know, um, if you're an artist, even if you're, if you're not regularly exhibiting at a gallery, you, you always have that notebook, you're always sketching. Or you can paint on, if you can afford it, on the, the, the canvas with the oil paints. You can always work. Writers can always write, even if they're piling up, you know, the the great novel in 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 the drawers. Poets can always write, and musicians can always play their instrument and find other friends to play with, and so forth. Actors, you really can't. You 
know. And I, when you get the phone call to say you've got the job, it's it's the equivalent of somebody saying to you, um, "We give you permission to be an actor, starting next Monday," and you are given permission to be an actor for the next three weeks. But three weeks from Friday, permission is withdrawn, and you're no longer allowed to be an actor until somebody else gives you permission to be an actor. I, I, I would say to people, you know, examine your motives. If there's anything else you want to do or think you can do, do that. Um, only if it's, I mean, I, I'm not equipped to do anything else. I'm useless at anything else. So um, uh, I'm stuck with it. But so if there's nothing else, then follow the dream, follow the dream. But be aware the the, uh, the statistics for the membership of SAG-AFTRA in the States, equity in this country, I think is that 95% of the membership of the union is unemployed at any given time. The vast majority uh, of, of the membership of both unions are earning less than £10,000 or $10,000 a year. And that's not a living wage in anybody's money. And you know, people, people assume if you work in the movies, you're earning telephone numbers. Well, some people are, but it's a handful of people. You know, it, it's it's a struggle, and as you mentioned, the knockbacks. If you're thin-skinned in any way, steer clear, because the knockbacks will come, and and it. You won't get a job, not because you're not good enough. You won't get a job because you're five foot five, and the actress they're going to cast is five foot eight, and and it looks odd that you're smaller than than she is, or your eyes are the wrong color, or you know, whatever it may be, or they're, they're looking for someone who looks a little bit Greek or something, you know. All of which is completely out of your control. There's nothing you can do about that. You are controlled by other people and other forces a lot of the time. When it's, when it's, when it's good, there's nothing better. And when it's not, it's shit. So, you know, I, I, I would just ask people to be cold-eyed and and uh, and serious about it but follow the dream if it's what you want to do just to wrap it up where can fans look out for if they want to see upcoming projects and that kind of thing uh, I've just I've just uh, voiced a character for a, um, uh, an animated movie uh, I think I think it was originally a graphic novel it's um, uh, called uh, Howard Phillips Lovecraft and the Frozen Kingdom so it's it's uh, it's built it explores the Lovecraft um, mythology, but it's Lovecraft as a boy, and it's Lovecraft relating to his father and using biographical details from Lovecraft's life. I'm playing Nialat Hotep, one of the elder gods of Lovecraft's mythology, and I've done the sequel already for it as well. Uh, Howard Phillips Lovecraft and the Underwater Kingdom. Uh, Ron Perlman and Christopher Plummer are also in the cast, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, there's a few other things bubbling under, but you know, uh, the more you talk about them, the less they happen. So uh, that one's done. Yeah. And the check's in the bank, so I can talk about that one. <laughs> um, uh, the others will we'll wait and see, but th there are a few other things down the pipeline as well. Wicked. Well, thank you for joining us today, Doug. We're all huge fans of you, and it's great to see you at Horror Con, and we hope to see you here again. Pleasure to be here. Slime House TV. Sorry, talking over you. Go again. I was talking over you. This man. Slime House TV. You do as well. Slime House TV.